Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Secure Talk. Secure Talk is brought to you by Adequest, your cybersecurity and compliance partner. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Secure Talk. Today, we have uh, a, a special episode because we're going to be looking at security from a slightly different context. We're going to be looking at digital or security from the context of <clears throat> digital engagement security um, or engagement security solutions. And we're going to be talking with Kathleen Booth, who is the VP of Marketing at Clean.io. Hey, Kathleen, how are you today? I'm great, thanks, Mark. How are you doing? Pretty good. It's uh, I'm in Seattle, and we are experience, experiencing what we would call a heat wave. It's in the, in the 90s today. Um, are you back on the East Coast? Yeah, I'm based out of Baltimore, Maryland, and it has been really hot here, but today it is in the 60s and pouring rain. So I feel like we've somehow swapped normal wow. realities. Wow, yeah, <laughs> massive juxtaposition there. Um, you know, you've been in with uh, uh, with Clean IO for a while, and you've also been in the marketing space prior to uh, uh, to Clean IO. You spent about 13 years in digital marketing. Um, you also have a, a podcast re related to, uh, to 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 digital marketing. It's, I think it's called Inbound Success Podcast. That's correct. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because a lot of times we look at security from, you know, a security engineer's perspective, intrusion detection uh, from, you know, malware or phishing threats. But you you and your firm are out there helping organizations with something called digital engagement security. What exactly is that? Yeah, great question. And it's definitely a term that I think a lot of folks haven't heard, but hopefully will increasingly uh, be talking about because there's a real gap. You know, when it comes to cybersecurity, um, I guess I have a, a sort of unique perspective because I, as you said, I spent the bulk of my career in marketing and I owned a digital marketing agency for 11 years. I had at the time, I think it was five or more uh, clients that were in the cybersecurity sector, which was my first exposure really to cybersecurity. And then uh, since that time, since I exited, I went on and, and have been the in-house head of marketing for a number of companies, some of which have been in cyber. So I, I am this marketer who's had a lot of exposure to cyber and it really has opened my eyes. And, and clean.io where I am now is really the first company where that I saw that was bringing it all together. And that's one of the reasons I came here. And so really what digital engagement security is all about is recognizing the reality that we all know is is happening, which is that we're in this pe this massive period of shift where historically most of the engagements that we as businesses have had with our customers, our users, our audience, whatever term you want to use to describe the people that you interact with as a business, most of those engagements have happened historically in the real world. So it used to be all about when somebody comes into your office or when someone enters your store, what impression do they get? You know, is their experience a good one? Is it a safe and welcoming environment? Um, and you know, you had a lot of control over that when it was in your physical space that you owned and operated. But as we've shifted to this online world and, and more so now than ever because of COVID, you know, that has, that's really sped up the move to e-commerce and and you know the way that businesses look at, at how they're going to interact with their audiences online, more so now than ever, these engagements are happening in the digital realm. And so, whereas before you had a lot of control over the experience that someone had when they walked into your office or came into your store, now it's all about what's the experience they have when they come to your website. And you know, because I'm a marketer, I look at it through a marketer's eyes and we marketers have always been told the web, your website is the property that you own. Your, it's your digital owned property. And, and so that makes you think as a marketer that you have complete control over what happens on your site, but the reality could not be farther from that. You really don't have complete control. And, you know, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know, but the way the modern internet works um, and the way websites are built, we, have a lot of third-party code that runs on our sites, uh, whether that's code we allow into our sites or code that comes there, whether we allow it in or not. And it has a big impact on the user experience. It can have a big impact on your revenue, on your brand reputation. And so digital engagement security is all about securing those points of digital engagement that we have with our customers, our users, our audiences 
in the online realm to protect our brands, our user experience and our revenue. Thank you. That was a, a lot of information uh, <laughs> and, very, and very helpful. Um, can you give some examples of third party code uh, that would be, you know, built into uh, somebody who's, you know, tra trying to transact business online? Sure. So, so there's different categories. There's what I would call um, trusted, untrusted and malicious code. Um, so trusted code is the code that we put on our own websites. And so, you know, I, I used to own an agency that built a lot of websites and, and, you know, in this day and age, you're, you tend to build a site on some sort of a platform, whether it's a, a WordPress, or a, if you're in e-commerce, it might be Shopify or Magento, or maybe you're building it on an Adobe property. Usually you're building on some kind of a content management system that already exists. And so you know, that, that is code that you don't control, but it is trusted. You've chosen to build your website on that platform. Um, and then there might be other plugins that you put on your website, such as Google analytics. That is a, you know, third party piece of JavaScript that you put on your website. Um, and you trust that code. Those are some examples of trusted code. Then there's untrusted code, which is code that you put on your website that maybe you don't know as much about. So a lot of these website platforms have vast plugin ecosystems, you know, WordPress being a great example. There's millions of plugins that you can choose from when you build a WordPress site, you know, and let's say you want to feed your Instagram feed into your website. Um, you know, you go into a marketplace and you, you have, you look at reviews and you have to kind of take it on faith that what you're getting is going to work, but also isn't, you know, going to provide some backdoor into your site for somebody who wants access or isn't going to mess up the user experience. And so that's like untrusted code. And then the other form of untrusted code is in the form of what client side injections. And so that's kind of a fancy term, but it refers to any code that comes in through the person who's visiting your site. So for example, what a lot of marketers don't realize, and I didn't know this until I came to work here, is that when you add a browser extension to your web, your internet browser, whether you're using Chrome or Safari or Edge or, or what have you, when you add a browser extension to that browser, it has an elevated level of permissions to operate and, and potentially change things on your web on a website that you visit. So, you know, for example, as a marketer, one of the browser extensions that I use is um, it's called Color Picker. And literally, it just lets me go onto a website and I can put an eyedropper using my cursor on any element on the page. And it'll give me, it reads the code on the page and it tells me, you know, what the hex code is for the color. It's a really niche use case, but it's able to see the code on the website. Um, and there are plenty of other examples. One that we deal with at my company is, is coupon extensions, for example. Lots of shoppers use Honey or Capital One Shopping. They don't just look at code on your site, they actually inject code into websites. So if you're a shopper and you have it and you go to an e-commerce store on the internet and you put a bunch of items in the shopping cart, this extension will pop up in your browser and say, do you want us to test coupon codes and see if we can get you a deal? And if you click yes, it will auto inject all the codes it finds into the promo code field at checkout until it finds the one that gives you the biggest discount. And so that's actually injecting code. Um, wow. So, so let me ask you this. I mean, if, if you're going to go in and advise somebody in terms of their e-commerce site, and you just talked about three types of third-party code there, yeah. Um, you know, where do you start and, and, and how do you figure out, okay, yeah, basically where do you get, where do you get started and, and how do you figure out if, if their site is safe and if the code that they're using is, 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 is safe as well? Sure. And I'll just make one note before I answer that, which is there is that last category of code, which is malicious code. So I talked about trusted and untrusted malicious code is actually like what it sounds like. It's code that is designed to do something nefarious on your site. We think of it as malware. Um, you know, that's the common name that it's known by. Everybody understands what that is. So with that being said, you know, what, what we, what I would say people should look at and how we advise customers is really, um, you know, you need, the first step is awareness, right? You need to understand all the code you're putting on your site because there is a lot of code we put there ourselves and you need to do your homework on 
where it's coming from, who's making it, has it been vetted, you know, what sort of security provisions are put in place? How often is it updated? Because that's the other problem. This isn't a one-time thing where you put the code on and then you forget about it. You have to make sure that they're updating it and patching it. Um, you know, there's, there's that element of just doing your homework. And then I think even more important than that is, is on an ongoing basis, really having a keen eye on your website performance data and looking at everything from site latency, because a lot of time third-party code will, will slow down your site. And that's the, one of the first indicators is if your page load times slow down, you might have a problem. Um, but also looking at all the different business metrics you track through your website. So I mentioned the example of coupon codes. And oftentimes people don't realize they have a problem with those sorts of browser extensions unless they're you know, watching closely how their codes are used. And if they see a sudden spike in usage, that's usually a tell that they have a problem with a coupon code. Um, on the other side of our business, we help protect large online websites against malvertising, which is malicious ads. So that would be that, that malicious code. And very often the way it's usually publishers, you know, think uh, uh, newspapers or TV stations that have websites and take ads. Oftentimes the way they figure out they have a problem is when a user on their website complains and says, I clicked on one of your ads and it took me to a scam or took me to a pop-up I couldn't get rid of. So, you know, you want to get ahead of a user being the one to let you know there's a problem. So it's do your homework on the apps that you're putting on the code you're putting on your site. It's watch all your metrics to see if anything unusual is happening. And then I would say third, the last you know, piece of advice is there are a lot of tools out there, obviously that you can put on your site. We're one of many, I'm not gonna you know, sit and plug my solution, but we're one of many options that are affordable that you can invest in that will monitor a lot of this for you. And so you know, there, there's really very little excuse not to do something about it. The issue tends to be that marketers own the website. And you know, as a marketer myself, <laughs> Right. Uh, marketers don't think that they have any responsibility for, for security. And that's really the biggest problem is it's, it's recognizing that you have ownership over that. So, so how do you um, structure that conversation? I mean, when you go in, I mean, I, most of the companies we work with, they have, you know, a, a CISO or, um, uh, security engineers or a security team. Um, we rarely meet with the marketing team people. Um, how do you, I mean, how do you start that conversation? Yeah, I mean, what I usually talk about is, first of all, that, you know, recent data indicates that marketers now have larger IT budgets than the IT departments at many companies. You know, if you think about the tech stack that supports marketing, it's often pretty substantial. Um, and so that's first. If, if you're controlling the bulk of an organization's spend around technology um, and IT, you have to take some ownership over it because you you inherently are a point of vulnerability for the company, especially because so many of the applications that we as marketers use are cloud-based and therefore provide an easy entry point for somebody who wants to gain access to you know sensitive business information, PII, et cetera. Um, so that's number one. We have these budgets, we're spending on tech, we need to take ownership for, for the implications of that spend. Number two though, and this is really, you know, you'll notice we talk about it as digital engagement security and not cybersecurity. And the reason is that marketers hear the word cybersecurity and their eyes roll into the back of their heads. <laughs> they don't, that's that's they don't not my job. That's not them. my job. Yeah. We got somebody else doing that, right? Exactly. <laughs> la la la. You know, I don't want to talk about it. And so so when we talk about it, we talk about digital engagements and, and we really have to focus on what's in it for me. And this is with anything. Um, and what's in it for marketers is that if you don't take ownership over this and if you ignore it, you run the risk of hurting three things which go right to the heart of a marketer's job. The first is brand reputation. The second is user experience. And the third is revenue. And if as a marketer, you're not concerned about protecting those three things, you shouldn't be in the role you're in. Like that, that's really the bottom line. And if, if you can't control the experience somebody has on your website and how code affects those things, then you can't control user experience, brand and revenue. No, I, I love how you just tied that security into um, user experience, uh, brand reputation and, and revenue. I mean, that's, that's critical right there. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about, um, 
you know, coupons, coupon strategies, what are some best practices and what are some things to be aware of both from maybe from, you know, the uh, B to C or B to B marketer point of view, but also from the consumer's point of view. Yeah. So this is an interesting thing and I'm so passionate about it. So beware. Um, you know, when I, <laughs> yeah, when I came into this role, I, you know, I had experienced coupon extensions as a shopper. So I've used honey, I've used capital one shopping. Um, and they seem great. You know, you put them in your browser and you go shopping for things and, and with a click of a button, they can often save you a bunch of money, but my eyes kind of started to get open to the, I would call it the other side of the coin when I came here, because our script sits on page for a large number of online retailers. And, and so we see on the back end, not only how coupon extensions work, but the damage they do. So I, I need to start by just explaining quickly how they work, which is that the way these coupon extensions get all of these codes that they're able to then pop into your checkout and save you money with is they scrape them. So if I am a customer, like a loyal customer for a business I love, let's say it's a clothing brand in my hometown in Annapolis, and I love this business. I shop from them all the time. I'm one of their VIP customers. They send me a code in an email saying, you've, you know, you've given us all this business. We'd love to give you 25% off. When they send that to me as a business, they're sending it only to their VIP customers. And they've done, there's a calculus that happens behind the scenes of how many of those customers do we have? How much of a discount are we willing to give them? And what is that going to mean in terms of the, the hit we take on our profit margins and our revenue? So, so I get the code. I have, let's say honey, we'll just use honey as our example. I have that installed in my browser. I go to the website, I shop, I put items in my cart. I don't even need to use honey. I can just, if I type the code in at checkout, because honey is present in my browser, it's going to scrape that code. And then it's going to give it to everybody else who uses honey. So all of a sudden that code that the retailer only wanted to go to its VIP customers is going to everyone. That's just one example. That doesn't even sound legal actually, but uh, I'm sure, I'm sure technically that there's a workaround on that, but that, you know, it's, I guess it's, like it's certainly um, <laughs> questionable and where it gets really dicey to me and where I start to get fired up is we see a lot of the codes that people are attempting using these extensions. And I've seen codes like military hero, 20 frontline responder, 30. I've seen employee discount codes. You know, the, I always tell this story of like, I would never walk into the restaurant down the street for lunch and say, Hey, can I get 20% off because I'm in the army? If I wasn't really in the army, right? Like it, that's absolutely so wrong. And yet we do it through coupon extensions by using codes that weren't intended for us. And, and in many cases were intended for people who you know, really earn them by sacrificing something or, or employees like an 80% off employee discount should not be something that anyone else should have access to, you know, and, and yes, one could say like, well, the stores should do a better job of locking down their coupon codes. Absolutely. But guess who, guess who doesn't do that? It's the small retailers, the ones who lack the resources and the expertise, the big retailers, the Walmarts, et cetera, they usually have all that stuff on lockdown. They know what to do. And so if you're somebody who's passionate about, you know, promoting and supporting smaller independent retailers, you should care a lot about this because they're the ones that are really taking the hit. And so that's my, my sort of Ted talk on, on why shoppers should care, but on the retailer side, it's a big deal for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, as you can imagine, you're going to take a big hit in your margins if you don't control this more effectively. Two, it, from a marketing standpoint, it really messes with your ability to do attribution reporting. So very often codes are used as part of the marketing mix to understand what's working and what's not. So I might decide to advertise on a podcast to promote my product that I'm selling in my e-commerce store. And I might give out a promo code. And in theory, anybody who uses that code is somebody who's listened to the podcast. And so then I know, well, that podcast ad worked or it didn't. And I can make a decision about where to put my future marketing dollars based on that. But as soon as a coupon extension picks up that code and gives it out, I can no longer trust that data that I'm getting. And where it gets even worse 
is a lot of e-commerce brands use affiliate marketing to get the word out. So they partner with influencers or other affiliate networks and they give them special codes and, you know, we'll make up a hypothetical example. Like I might decide to pay one of the Kardashians to, to mention my product on their Instagram. And I might say, give them this code and anybody that comes through this code is going to get a discount. And oh, by the way, Kardashian, I'm going to pay you a cut of the sales that you drive. That's generally how affiliate marketing works is they get a cut of the sales. As soon as a coupon extension picks up that code, not only are you giving away margin to a lot of people that didn't come through that affiliate, but you're now paying your affiliate for sales that they didn't drive. So you're it's actually like incentivizing them to spread that coupon code around through these other channels versus their own community. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. Bingo. Yeah. It's, it's really bad. And, and it goes deeper than that. And I could go on and on, but I, you know, we, well, that would be a whole separate podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, then we'll go back to your podcast. But, um, I, so, so what are the solutions then? I mean, I'm a small, medium sized business. Um, and, and I, and I do want to issue coupon codes to my premium customers or sometimes, uh, maybe to a, you know, a specific organization uh, to kickstart a, you know, a, a, a drive with them, but how can I do that? Yeah, so I think there's there's two different approaches you can take. And I always like saying, you know, there's the the easy approach if you have a budget, we make a tool that solves the problem and we're not the only one. Again, there's other tools out there. Also, ours is called Clean Cart and you put it in your shopping cart, your your website and it prevents the coupon extensions from automatically injecting the codes. And it also gives you a lot of intel on on what, you know, what codes people are using and and how the extensions have picked them up. That's if you have a budget. And I know not everybody does. And so you don't always need to buy a tool. You know, I think the, the simplest solution is, like I said earlier, to really watch your data and watch coupon code usage. And if you see a sudden spike in use of a particular code, odds are it's been picked up by a coupon extension. And there are a lot of manual things you can do. You know, you can go to these coupon sites, they all list the codes. Like if you go to the Honey website, and, and type in your website name, you can see the codes that they have for you and understand like what average discount they're finding. And then you can always appeal to them to remove your, their, your codes from their site. They don't always agree to do that. <laughs> Oftentimes they say, oh, join our affiliate program and you'll have more granular control over your codes. What that basically means is they're twisting your arm and saying, join our program so that then you will have to pay us when we drive sales to you and in doing so, we'll give you a little bit more control. So it's it's frustrating. It's a really frustrating situation, and we're trying to help solve it. Well, aside from the kind of borderline ethical issues there for a consumer using a code that wasn't really intended for them, but they go ahead and use it, um, are there any security concerns for you know consumers who are you know using these coupon services? or that have the, um, the extensions on, on their browsers and their, their, you know, that are tracking their activities. Have, has there, have there been any, you know, any attacks or, uh, compromises that, that people should be aware of? I haven't necessarily heard of like attacks or compromises where PII has leaked, but, but there is a lot of talk. It, it all depends on how much you care about your privacy because so honey is a great example. Honey was purchased by PayPal for $4 billion. Um, the reason that PayPal paid that much for honey is not that honey makes a ton of money. I mean, it makes, it makes a good amount of money. PayPal was buying data and what they were buying is all of the data about every place that you as a honey user shop, how you spend your money, where you spend your money and they're a payment processor. So, you know, all of a sudden PayPal has this ability, this massive ability to triangulate how much you're spending, where you're spending it. Um, it's. If you care about data, I think that's that's the other thing you should be worried about. It is getting pretty spooky. I mean, I, I can go to Google. We can all go to whatever you know browser of choice, and you know I'll do a search for T-shirts or or whatever it is, and then instantly when I go to Facebook or wherever my next site, I'm getting bombarded with ads for exactly what I was searching for, right? And and then when you throw AI into the pitch, uh, it, it, where you know, they, they create a user profile and they basically know based upon all the different websites that you've been to and the things that you've purchased in the past, they know what your hot buttons are. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're pretty, in my opinion, ripe for manipulation. And, um, I think 
you know, I, at least I try to teach my kids and, and people I know to be at least be aware of what's happening. Well, and it's even worse if you think about the uh, Honey's competitor, which is Capital One Shopping. It used to be called Wikibuy, and much like PayPal bought Honey, Capital One bought Wikibuy. And when you think about what that means now, Capital One Shopping, again, it can see where you're spending your money, how much you're spending, and exactly what you're buying. But Capital One, if you also use their credit cards, it can see your spending you know, habits there. If you have your bank accounts with Capital One, it knows your net worth. Like it knows a crazy amount about your individual financial situation and spending habits. Yeah, it's um, like I said, it's getting it's getting kind of spooky. <laughs> yeah. But uh, well, hey, let me ask you this: a couple more questions here. Um, let's say that you you are um, you know you're a new CMO. And you're, you're, you're stepping into this organization. You're doing a lot of marketing online. I mean, everybody is these days. I mean, I, yeah. I don't think, you know, so, so, so what, what, are, what are the first things that, that you, you would do in t- from the, the context of security and possibly firming up your, uh, you know, your discount code strategy? Yeah. So I think the first thing I tell all marketers is just honestly start by learning a little bit about cybersecurity in general. And there are so many good courses and training things out there. You know, the US government's um, CISA has really good resources on its website that are vendor agnostic, where you can learn even basic terminology and get an understanding of, of fundamental cyber principles. Then there are also a lot of like, training providers that, you know, I think more and more companies these days are, are making their employees go through basic cybersecurity awareness training, which I think is really positive. So as a CMO coming in, if your company hasn't put all of that in place, take the initiative and do some of it on your own so that at least you are more cyber aware. That's number one. Number two then, and hopefully to some extent you're doing this already, it's take an inventory of your tech stack. Understand every piece of software Um, every SaaS subscription you have, catalog it, you know, do it in a spreadsheet, but then take it a level deeper. You know, I talked about the website and how you might have plugins and little scripts added to your site. You really need to understand all the different pieces of JavaScript and third-party code that are operating on your site. And the good thing is there's plenty of tools out there that can tell you that really easily, like, you know, like built with, which funny enough is a browser extension, (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, and so it is another piece of third-party code. Sometimes they can be used for good and not evil, Um, but, but catalog it all and then do a little, you know, whether you do it or have somebody else do it, try to do some homework on, you know, have you really vetted all of those different providers of that code. And are there any in there that you don't feel confident about? You know, a great example is people build a lot of word uh, websites on WordPress. And I think it was just two years ago, the US government released a big advisory um, that there was a, a WordPress theme sold through the Envato marketplace, which is one of the most common trusted WordPress marketplaces that was actually malware. The theme itself was built by somebody who built it expressly for the purpose of harvesting personally identifiable information, payment information. And that theme was in use by, I want to say thousands, if not tens of thousands of websites around the world. You know, you, yeah. you got to well, do your homework. <laughs> exactly. And when you, when you buy a theme from a trusted, uh, you know, marketplace like Envato, you, you pretty much, I guess you assume um, which you know you should never do, but you you do assume that it's already been tested and and um, it is safe. But uh, that's the problem. Well, let me ask you. I mean, that was some really good advice. But where where do you go to stay up to date and informed? So I think there's there's two things. One, um, I do advise everybody to have some sort of either if unless if you don't have a CISO in house who's really on top of all this, and a lot of companies don't find an outsourced provider that can help you, whether that's a managed security services provider or, you know, whether that's the IT firm that that helps you with your your network. Um, find somebody whose job it is to stay on top of things for you and, and sit down with them and explain what you're trying to accomplish and see if they can help. Um, so, so I have resources like that, but then I also, you know, do monitor, there are, there are alerts that come out from, I think it's US CERT. Uh, I'm digging back into my cyber memory here that publishes alerts on like major breaches. And I do try to monitor that and and the tech press in general, I try to watch. Um, But again, it's for me, it's first and foremost, it's about watching the data. As as soon as I see a red flag, has my site slowed down? Am I seeing an uptick in a certain metric? Those are usually the indicators that tip you off that something's wrong. 
And then what about the, from the context of the, from the marketing context in terms of, you know, marketing and, and security, are there any industry publications that, that, that you, you know, that you look at in terms of, oh, Hey, here, here's some new best practices related to uh, coupon codes, or here's some, here's some concerns related to, uh, you know, uh, uh, browser extensions, et cetera. I wish I could say there was, and, <laughs> and this is, I often get asked when I'm interviewed, you know, what my predictions are for the future in marketing. And my prediction is always that I think we're going to see like a, a, an industry crop up that is around marketing security or what I like to call Marsec. Um, that doesn't really exist today. And so there's, there, there are places here and there around the internet that sometimes talk about it. I mean, we, we, publish a lot of this on our blog, but there are not, there is not a definitive resource at this point, in my opinion, for that topic. Unfortunately. I, I would tend to agree with you. That there's a huge opportunity there because if you, if you take the security side and then you kind of, uh, look at the data protection and all the requirements, you know, for example, with GDPR and HIPAA and everything else yeah. and, and PII, um, I, you know, it, it's a huge part of any CMOs or any marketing team's job is to protect that data. So um, I, I agree with you. Hey, uh, Kathleen, one last question. I know that you do a podcast, uh, the Inbound Success Podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. So um, I literally yesterday published episode 200, which I'm really wow. excited about. Um, I, I've stuck with this podcast longer than I've stuck with most things in my life, <laughs> with the exception <laughs> of my marriage. <laughs> um, I have stuck with that longer, thank goodness. Um, no, it's, I've been doing it for about four years and I, I started it because I used to own a marketing agency and I would go to a lot of marketing conferences and hear people talk about their supposed, you know, how they were supposedly crushing it. And I would leave these sessions feeling like they just spent an hour telling me why I should do something and not how I should do it. And so my podcast is all about breaking down what really successful marketers are doing and making it actionable for listeners so that they can go and then improve their own marketing results. That is awesome. Well, hey, Kathleen, I'm going to put a link to uh, to your, your 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 podcast and also to Clean IO in the description of this podcast or this episode. And uh, I have really enjoyed this conversation. Wish I had more time, but um, I've learned a lot and uh, would like to keep in touch and hopefully have you come back uh, in you know in a few months down the road and and talk about what's new in your space. Anytime, I would love that, Mark. And thanks for having me on. Thanks, Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance.